having an event like this, sharing the history of Key Biscayne, um, really helps draw the community together and share our common history and you know our common goals for where we want this community to be in the present and in the future. We are doing this in conjunction with the Key Biscayne Historical and Heritage Society, which Frank is the president. Correct? Joan and Prudence and, and others contribute enormously to something that is just endlessly interesting. If anybody wants to be involved in this um, group, you'll find enrichment, you'll find friends, you'll find um, opportunities to learn things about your home that are interesting. Uh, you're always welcome. Hello everybody. <clears throat> My name is Betty Sim Conroy. I've lived on Key Biscayne since 1963, so I think it is appropriate that I can talk a little bit about our history. First of all, how lucky we are to be here in this beautiful park that was purchased by our village council. And all of this happened after that wonderful word, incorporation. So <clears throat> aside from talking about my three children who were all key rats and ha are now out on their own, we'll skip over all that part of my history and go to what I think is a little bit of an unknown pre-incorporation history. Back in the 1980s, Key Biscayne was a sleepy little village. The mention of incorporation was almost like saying a bad word. They, people, people were very happy just being quiet, not having anything to do with politics, and uh, had no, they, they couldn't envision what we have today, like with our beautiful buildings and everything we've been able to do, because they thought it wouldn't be possible to afford it. And you know what, I can understand that. You know, looking around at what we have, who would have thought that this all could have happened? The only representation we had with Dade County was with a group called the Taxpayers Association. They were self-appointed. Most of them lived out here in the towers and they had a very strong relationship with Harvey Reuven, who was our county representative. But really most people on the key didn't know what they were saying to the county because there wasn't, wasn't really a lot of action. There was a group of people, Dick Cribardi, Bill Coysdale, Don Berg, Helen White, and then finally Gene Stearns that had the vision to see what incorporation could bring to us. But they were a very, very small group, had really little credibility, and uh, what happened is Gene Stearns got interested, really interested. So he went to one of the taxpayers meetings, and I honestly forget what the topic was, but they said, I'm sorry, you can't come in here. Well, they said that to the wrong person. <laughs> so he realized that there was no representative government, that uh, this taxpayers group, they could say whatever they wanted, and the rest of the citizens on Key Biscayne had no idea what they were saying. So they decided, let's have an elected group. Let's have an election. Now this elected group, they were to elect nine people, had no taxing power, uh, had no zoning power, had very little power, period, <laughs> had no money, but they, the only thing they could do is they could, they could let everybody know what was going on. So uh, they scheduled an election. This was in November of 1987 and the citizens of voting people on the key were to decide whether to have this elected group. And honestly, I think it probably was going to fail. But, and I have a theory having uh, majored in history, is history decided by people, by leaders, or is it events? Well, the event, I think in this case it's probably a combination, but I really truly think this one event was crucial in what happened. Uh, I don't know if you all have heard of Mabel Miller. She's a fantastic naturalist, a treasure that we had out here because I know Joan Gilblank knows her, knew her very well, and I knew her too. So one morning uh, in November 1987, Sunday morning, 7 a.m., I got a call from Mabel Miller. They are tearing down the trees in the middle of Crandon Boulevard. We have to stop them. And I'm like, what? You know, I'm half asleep, but I threw on my clothes went down to Crandon, and she was there, as was Joe Podgore, who was the head of the Friends of Everglades. And literally, we put our hands up, 
and we said stop in front of the bulldozers. Uh, I wanted to be able to go from the parking lot to where they were having the tennis center because they had big ideas. Who knows whether it was going to be a hotel or what events, but that's the reason they were cutting down the trees. Now they said they have all their licenses. You could go to jail, and we decided, well, it's worth it. <laughs> if that happens, we'll go to jail. But they did stop, and for the first time, we got a lot of publicity, and people off the island sided with us because who likes these beautiful 100-year-old trees being literally cut down? Uh, the next step there, and honestly, this was, as I recall it, was Mabel's idea. She was so smart. I mean, she wasn't just a teacher. She knew how to get things done, and she said, we need an event. So a whole group of us, and I remember Diane Simon pushing her baby carriage. There were old people, young people, babies, teenagers. We all met in Calusa. We had sticks with yellow flags, and that represented the trees. And we marched from Calusa down to Crandon Park. And boy, did we get the press. We had the newspapers out there, and we had, you know, tremendous amount of advertising and press, and it, it was it was wonderful because our cause became known. Well, not only did it be, become known in town, suddenly everybody on Key Biscayne woke up. They realized they couldn't trust the county. There had been no notification that this was even going to happen, and they they realized that probably the taxpayers wasn't enough, the little group, and that we did need some kind of an elective representative government. So the, uh, the actual election to decide whether to have this nine-member, quote, council was, I think, about two weeks later, and it did pass. It was approved. And I was on the council. I was elected. <laughs> it was a bigger job than I ever possibly imagined because we had no money. We had uh, no people helping us, nobody taking notes. We were it. We were the ones that had to do everything. And it happened at the time that what Dade County had in store for us was four uh, huge, huge developments. They're called, in fact, we don't even have any of this anymore because after that some of the wonderful politicians eliminated them. But they, it was, they were called DRI, which is Development of Regional Impact. And that means that these developments were so big that they wouldn't have an impact just on the little neighborhood around them, but a huge regional impact. So our job then, in our little representative group that was elected, was to fight, to fight against these. Because to give you an idea, they wanted two Development of Regional Impacts, one uh, where we now have Ocean Club, one where the Sheridan was, and each one had a thousand room hotel. That's the size of the Fountain Blue. That's two thousand room hotels plus 800 condos on each property. Our island by now would have been lopsided. It would have <laughs> sunk totally if that had happened. And uh, we, we did everything we could. We had everybody in the island had t-shirts. We'd go down to the county commission. We would fight as hard as we could. Sometimes we'd get one vote, Harvey Rubin. Sometimes we wouldn't get any votes. And again, people out here started realizing how the county didn't care, didn't care about us. Now, these developments, truthfully, could have been, they were approved by the county. And the only reason that they didn't actually become built is that the economy sank. They, they didn't have the money. So we were very lucky that that happened. Then, the first two years, we were elected in November of 87. In the first two years, we spent fighting all these developments. Oh, <laughs> the Sequarium. The Sequarium wanted to put a water theme park. Can you imagine on a hot Sunday, everybody at the beach, everybody at the water theme park, what our causeway would be like? So we fought that. We, we really went after that. And um, Gene Stearns and his whole law firm, they were our pro bono lawyers. Thank you heavens because I don't think we could have accomplished what we did without them and in that lawsuit <laughs> Arthur Hertz who was the head of this aquarium accused me of saying I don't want this development because I don't want those people coming to Key Biscayne well of course I didn't say that <laughs> but it was it was in a conversation between me and uh, the people in 
Tallahassee. So it was their word against my word. So I had to go to court. I had to testify that I didn't say that. This is how, I want you all to understand this, how hard we had to fight and what we had to go through to, to try and protect our island. Uh, and sadly, in those days, and it may still be true now, the only leverage we had was the lawsuits. So we, we won that lawsuit, and obviously it wasn't built, but um, it was a very, very tough time. So the first two years were spent fighting like that, but by then, the other key to our success is we had everything in the Islander, we talked to the newspapers as much as we could, so everybody in the key then knew what was going on. They hadn't known before. So then suddenly the word incorporation wasn't quite as, you didn't look down on it like they had before. They thought, well, maybe, maybe, really, this is the only answer. So we had had election in 87. Two years later, we had another election for everybody to vote. And one of the questions was, do you want us to study incorporation? And we won that. They did, they realize now how, what it could do for us. So that next two years, we researched incorporation, we went to other cities, we brought in uh, managers from other municipalities, and we had what we call the dog and pony show because uh, we had to educate everybody. We had uh, <coughs> three of us, and we went around, we'd go to the schools, we'd go to the condos, we'd go anywhere anybody would listen to us, and we had a whole dog and pony show telling everybody what incorporation really meant and what it could do for us. And still, it was a huge fight. The taxpayers had not given up. They came at us with everything they had, with every bit of artillery, every bit of bad-mouthing, every bit of scare tactics. It was a huge fight. You think we have fights now, like over the community center? That was the biggest one I've ever been involved in, and it was, we didn't know what was gonna happen. Oh, the other thing we had to do was we had to convince Dade County, the commission, to let us vote, to even let us vote to incorporate, because in there had not been a municipality since 1956, because that was when the Home Rule Charter was accepted in Dade County, and that was when they had quite a few municipalities, and Dade County itself was very small, but since then, 1957, you can imagine, uh, it had grown, it had grown tremendously. So. We were the first to really challenge. So just to get them, because they realized that on our little tax bill, if you look, the little section that says municipal taxes, they would lose because that little bit, and it's not a huge part of our tax bill, would then directly come to us. Because they also found out a lot of things like we asked Public Works at Dane County, what do you have on your list for Key Biscayne? And their answer was nothing. <laughs> and at that time, we had no storm drainage. I mean, the flooding was just incredible. Uh, and I, I wish that I really did have pictures of this. We used to have garbage strewn, like on the swales, like on West Masha. They'd just be piles of trash and garbage. Cranon Boulevard had no uh, sprinkler system, so they had these little poor palm trees that were half dead all the time. There was no beautification. There was no of these beautiful trees that we have now. It was quite a different place then. So, so yeah, a lot of weeds. So this was a major, major vote. The actual date of our incorporation was in 1991, and that's when we officially did become a village. But the, the vote before that, we won by a very, very small majority. We won by about 500 votes. That's how close it was whether we should incorporate. And that's that was the toughest battle. But once we won that, then we got the permission and then we went ahead and were able to write our charter and when we voted in 1991 to accept the charter, that's officially the beginning of incorporation. I think it's a really interesting part of our history and I, I'm thrilled that they're doing this and I hope that it will stay in our history books because as I said, nothing was written down then, we were all on our own. But it's been, it's been a good ride and I think we've been very successful in the whole process. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that bit of our history that is 
likely right is quite often forgotten or not not well documented um, and obviously we wouldn't be here at this neighborhood park today if we didn't have a village council to vote on purchasing it and if we hadn't decided that we should have our own democracy to make such decisions um, like having committees like a land acquisition committee to per to make suggestions as to purchases or votes from community members saying that they want more parks and green space so that was obviously incredibly important to uh, to where we are today I'll just try to take a subset of, of, of what Betty was talking about put the fact that we're here doing this thing as something of it, it'll be a slight exaggeration to say an evolutionary miracle. But the very fact that we're here on this property, which is now a beautifully designed, beautifully articulated, and much appreciated park, is something of an historical breakthrough. Because how does history happen? How do, how do decisions get made? We have had in this community what I'll call an ambivalent relationship with particularly this type of park. And the fact that this exists was not always ordained as a sure thing, despite the fact that park acquisition, land acquisition, has been a significant driver since the prehistorical epoch that Betty was talking about. Pre-incorporation, the very first that I know of, serious studious planning and zoning effort, among other things, was focused predominantly on parks and recreation open space deficiencies. And they were obvious and real. The county, in permitting DRIs, had no problem with our concurrency non-compliance. And even some in our community didn't, coming up with creative concurrency solutions like count the common areas within the condominium properties, the acreage, or count the median area, or the bike lanes on Cramden Boulevard, or count the beach, count the dimension of the beach as property to bear on the ratio of parks to population, we'll be fine. None of those things did much for the sports teams that were struggling to find a place to play, and none of those things really addressed at the time, a, a strong desire to have community gathering places just like this. There wasn't always interest or support in this type of acquisition. There was always interest and support for land assemblage on a massive scale. The Village Green, however, was controversial in its own right because the price is never right. It always should have been last year. The price was 60% cheaper last year. But we did the Village Green, and over time, not maybe a perfect solution, but it became a solution to the ball fields deficit. Um, the St. Agnes field was able to be repurposed as a playing field. We were able to purchase the former Sitco station, 530 Crandon. We were able to acquire the Beach Park and the Lake Park. We were able to establish a very beautiful butterfly garden. Uh, we were able to establish that nice overlook at Hacienda Canal. All of these things were able to be accomplished because there was will to do so. But many times we missed nice opportunities to acquire properties just like this in a consensual seller, willing seller, arm's length market negotiation. Don't think of the word eminent domain because it never arose and never would have arisen, in my opinion, because that's not what was palatable to the community, nor the sellers, nor was it necessary because properties come on the marketplace. And so not only individual properties, but for example, land assemblage opportunities that would have enabled strategic solutions if you could acquire four, five, six, eight lots, our land inventory situation is completely different. We missed a lot of opportunities over the years, and I think, come to think of it as I'm sitting here, I think the worst decision, the most regrettable non-action we ever took since incorporation was the failure to find a fifth vote to provide for financing on a very favorable financing deal on a pre-delivered package 
for a bayfront park. I still I do not understand the thinking that led to that non-decision. But like water makes rock softer, keep at it, and here we are. And doing this thing in this place is to me, um, it's kind of, I hate to use this on St. Patrick's Day, but it seems ecumenical to think of Moses, <laughs> who was able to see the promised land but not enter it. Well, here we are in, in our own little neighborhood park, in our pocket park, descriptively identified as such by some and derisively by others, pocket park. The, the contention had always been that introducing a park in a neighborhood is, is an example of governmental overreach and heavy handedness or, or would um, misplace the potential for nuisance as opposed to betterment. But in this case, the neighbors wanted it. The momentum was right. The opportunity was right. We'd learned from history all the misses. Here we are. So I think this is just great, and I'm glad to participate. Uh, I'm very nostalgic thinking about all the things that Betty asked me to do that were um, um, things that made me engage in this community when I first moved here one month before the 1987 vote. And it's been a long ride since. But as Betty said, this, I, the community is unrecognizable now and then. And the economic savings were basically as predicted in 1988-89. In 2011, we celebrated an anniversary. The statistic that was used then was providing for a full service government over those 20 years maintaining our 17% or whatever it is, slice of the ad valorem that we send over the bridge. We had provided for this beautified, full-service community with excellent services in all of the departments and saved $90 million in taxes. So how about a toast on St. Patrick's Day? Mm. <laughs> Schlumpton. Water. with a new park and a new hope for what will follow in this game. <laughs> You know, these things are made more fun when you get a little personal anecdote. Uh, we had a master plan committee pre-incorporation. I happened to be chairman of it, and we had two delightful people join the committee, Frank and a gal named Gina Coleman. Well, I hope that you realize that they not only met in the committee, they went on with their relationship, got married, have a beautiful daughter, and I think I should be godmother or something. <laughs> <laughs> Our daughter has uh, 13,000 godparents. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. That is the truth. Yeah. That really happens. So <laughs> some people go out for Chinese food and other people incorporate. <laughs> Welcome to all of you. Some of you may be surprised to learn that the members of the Simons family are following in the footsteps of distinguished forerunners by following a line or lineage, a notable gardener, settlers, planters, and horticultures who arrived in wooden ships on our tiny island long before there was a bridge. They sailed to Key Biscayne in sloops and schooners on the U.S. revenue cutters and barges, their decks and holes filled with tropical plants selected for planting on Key Biscayne. On our coastal beaches, they unloaded wooden crates and boxes and bags of seeds, nuts, cuttings, and saplings, including future flowering and fruiting trees, and they brought them from around the world. In the congressional records in Washington, D.C., I found 200-year-old invoices and ledgers, as well as original handwritten field notes and accounts that document pre-planning field notes and accounts that document the voyages of discovery and plant collecting and the caretaking of specimens years ago. These significant historic plantings of our first Key Biscayne gardens that began two centuries ago literally laid the groundwork for the future. Meet Henry Perrine. Trained as a botanist and physician, Perrine is perhaps best known for discovering quinine in the 1800s as a treatment for malaria. Perrine is also credited with first recorded introduction of the coconut palm, often mistaken as a Florida native to U.S. soil. 
Shortly after the Cape Florida Lighthouse was built in 1825, the U.S. Congress began encouraging the foreign plant importations. Corrine, as ambassador to the Cuban, uh, to the Yucatan, was advised, advised that introducing foreign plants at Cape Florida, quote, would be highly desirable to promote the peace and stability of the Union. Corrine enthusiastically began planning and in the 830s was collecting commercially valuable, viable plants to send to Cuba, Spain. He packed and shipped over 100 large boxes and crates, including tropical forests and from coastlines of Central America, and put lighthouse keeper Don, John Dubose in charge. After the land was prepared and the plants bedded, the keeper and several of his sons tended to it. But, the lighthouse was attacked. The keeper's cottage burned down and a history of bad hurricanes follows. Or as Perrine himself wrote, the Indians and the weather contrived against me. Meet the Osbournes in Fields, the next of the planters. Today, the Simons family, working in concert, had a vision of a neighborhood park and accomplished it together. In the 1880s, the family teams of Osborne and Fields sailed from Red Bay, New Jersey, with their crew for South Florida. Their vision was an avenue of coconut palms, stretching along coastal beaches from Jupiter to Key Biscayne, a kind of lineal park. They worked for several seasons planting over 76,000 coconuts brought by schooner from the West Indies in creation of their dream avenue. Some of the sprouting coconuts that survived on Key Biscayne, briefly, were identified in early 20th century photographs of Key Biscayne, but they lost their lives to marsh rabbits, high tides, and hurricanes. I should be key rats, so, you know, four-footed <laughs> key rat. There are 20th century photographs of Key Biscayne as the Jamaican talls, as the coconuts were called stood sentinel against the lighthouse. And I think you've probably seen some of those. 20 years after the coconut ventures came Mary Ann Davis and mother, meet them, who's, who was the mother of the Davis family. So meet the Davis family of the uh, early 1900s. After the coconut ventures, venturers had left South Florida, the Davis family arrived at Cape Florida. Water Smith Davis had a full-time character and gardener named Israel Lafayette Jones. They planted pineapples and coconuts, date and other palms, tropical fruit and flowering trees with everything arriving by boat. I found showing a land tract named Davis Park, Davis Park between the lighthouse and Cape, Hor Cape House, which was important because of its name Davis Park. There was a Pranchapani tree, which was one of their favorites, and I noticed there is one planted in this part. Also marked was a thickly planted grove of coconut palms, lining the bay side and a path to the lighthouse lined with coconuts. Davis Park had an informal central botanical garden of the owner's selection of trees he had seen while traveling around the world. The park became a seaside gathering place for the enjoyment of family and friends, and most often by neighbors, you won't guess this, but across the bay. There were no people on the escape. The neighbors from across the bay, some of whose names you know very well today, descendants, came by sailboat in the early 1900s and were famous for regatta parties and bowls of fish chowder. Commodore Ralph Monroe of the Barnacle, who I think some of you have been to the Barnacle, or most of you, uh, was a marine designer, a jack of all trades, trades, and a born environment who was on the Davis's payroll as superintendent of Davis Park, which was an unknown fact until I drug it up in Texas. <laughs> he made a map of Davis Park named it to honor the family matriarch, Mary Ann Davis, who in 1836 laid plans for the first town of Key Biscayne. The plans were drawn 
in Philadelphia was quite a formal and exciting event. But the town was not built, another story, and the name Davis Park did not remain. We know it now as Bill Baggs Cape Florida State Park. Meet W.J. Matheson, who really needs no introduction. Before turning a shovel of sandy soil on Key Biscayne, Matheson was well known in garden circles for his horticultural knowledge in Green Thumb and Long Island. He credited his gardener's skill for his blue ribbon dahlias and other honors bestowed on his remarkably landscaped estate at Oyster Bay in Long Island, which was surrounded by a pre-American revolutionary forest of ancient oaks and woodlands. Now it's a park and it's managed by the Nature Conservancy. Once in Florida, he directed his attention to tropical horticulture an interest ignited during a round-the-world sailing trip with informal stops at major tropical botanical gardens. Soon afterwards, he met his friend David Fairchild, the plant explorer, whose expeditions and work helped W.J. and his son transform the Sanbury Island into an island paradise. By 1920, they had a good start as they planted 36,000 coconut trees on the plantation. It was just the beginning. It was time then to take on a more challenging and significant scientific role in the development of tropical agriculture in the United States. Fairchild, a rising chief at the U.S. Agricultural Department in Washington, recorded that, quote, Matheson opened his unusual facilities on the island, which included a staff house, similar to this, but covered more, <laughs> Um, and all sorts of screen houses which protected the plants that came in for testing and were first, demonst first demonstrating their ability to grow in the U.S., surprisingly, on sandy soil of Key Biscayne. Several of these specimen trees included the baobab from Africa and the kaobak, uh, saba cantandra from Cuba, now listed with the state of Florida as a monument trees um, growing on the site of the present day village green where they were planted a hundred years ago. And they are marked on the heritage trail of Key Biscayne. In the 1940s, like skipping right along, the northern almost two thirds of the coconut plantation was doted by the Matheson family to Dade County as a county park to be held in perpetuity for public use only. South of Crandon Park, to the middle of the island and bounded to just north of the Pines Canal and what is now Cape Florida, Cape Park, additionally, mostly Matheson tracks were gradually sold and divided into residential and commercial lots to become a resort and residential community in the 1950s and later in 1991 formalized as an incorporated municipality about which we have learned. Our island is blessed by being surrounded by ocean and bay waters and embraced at the north and south ends by preserved and historic green parklands and space. So, on this day in March 2019, with the small group meeting and community in the park, the village of Picadus Cane's first neighborhood pocket park. You have met a few of yesterday's visionaries who set an historic precedent of planting gardens and designing parks of some consequence. What a pleasure to be here in this virgin setting of subtropical and tropical trees and plants already beginning to attract islanders and Florida bees local and migrating butterflies and birds, and all manners of species not so in view, but even now crawling and climbing and digging, and in fact, as we speak, taking stock and yes, bite of the garden's delectable offering. In closing, let me repeat a phrase I have always thought I might have the opportunity, the occasion to use and finally the time has come in this lovely, thoughtful, planted, and designed garden. It's a short phrase, 
I say it once and then I'll repeat it. As is the garden, so is the gardener. I'm repeating it. As is the garden, such is the garden. This is wonderful. I mean, going back that far in time to really establish how we got here, how we arrived at where we are today um, with, with the parks on either side of us and, uh, and this wonderful community in the middle. So thank you so much. Thank you, and I think it's just wonderful that you're carrying on the legacy of gardens and parks on to this Thank you. It's my pleasure. <laughs> so I think I'm as prepared as Betty and, and Joan. You always talk about QCN having been a sleepy community, <clears throat> and it sure was, but sometimes we forget what that means. So I thought I'd give a little context, what Key Biscayne was like in 74 when I first moved here as a young teenager. Um, and I'm sure there's people who've been here longer than that who could probably chime in and, and add to what Key Biscayne was really like in those days. Uh, it was sleepy indeed. It was a very different demographic uh, than we have today. It was mostly on the east side, the condos were mostly retirees, a lot of snowbirds that would come down. The families tended to be on this side. Uh, very few children overall. There were condos that didn't allow children. The elementary school, it was called the Kipskin Elementary School then, it was in a K-8, had 300 kids. Now it's 1,300. Uh, St. Agnes only had a 7th and 8th. Now it's a full, all the way to middle school. Um, to, I'd like to tie it into the neighborhood park because in many ways, Kibis King was an unofficial neighborhood park everywhere you went. Uh, a lot of the lots were not built on yet. So I can tell you after school, and part of what happens when it's such a small group of young people, teenagers, you really got to know everybody. And you got to know everybody well. You know, Betty's kid played sports with me in my entire childhood. Um, and there were things that were unique to keep this game. Uh, you know, after school, you know, we'd all go and either play basketball at the elementary school. Well, in those days, the elementary school was the first little building that's there. Now they've added two huge buildings, so we lost a lot of open space. A lot of, you know, what used to be part of our parks got lost. Same thing is true in St. Agnes. St. Agnes had two baseball diamonds uh, and a small church and a tiny little school. No, now it's a big school. Fortunately, we kept some of the open space there. They said an official neighborhood of parks included <coughs> Pines Canal. You know, at the end of Mariner, there were two empty lots, and somebody had hung a rope uh, from one of the uh, Australian pine trees. And every afternoon, you'd get 20 kids out there, boys, girls, everybody, just swinging into the pines. Uh, it sounds unlike South Florida, but that's what we did. Uh, the beach was a park. What does that mean? Well, you could play frisbee on the beach, you could play paddle ball on the beach. It was a very active beach. It was also a much wider beach. Uh, you know, giving it context. Uh, you could spend a day going pool hopping from pool to pool on, on, on the hotels on the beach. Uh, and that was what we did. We'd just we'd start at the Royal Biscayne and go to the Kibiskan Hotel, sneak into their pool, jump from their high platform, and, <laughs> and just had a great time. Um, get thrown out and then go, to, go to the next uh, pool. Um, you know, it was different. There were six gas stations, one bank. Kibiskan uh, Bank was it, you know, since then bought out by SunTrust. Uh, almost every property on, the, on that side included some sort of hotel-motel concept. Key Colony was a motel on the water and a golf course. So I lived on Ocean Lane Drive for a while. So every afternoon, once the golf course golfers were done, you'd play on the golf course. We'd dive in the ponds at the golf course and get golf balls out. Um, Hello, Gators. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the Kibiskan Hotel had a golf course within it as well. And all the property in front of the Kibiskan Hotel, Kibiskan Hotel would have been an ocean drive, was all empty lots. You know, right here, the Village Green was an empty lot. And kids used to play hide and seek and and who knows what else they were doing in there. Uh, <laughs> it was a tree farm. It was a tree farm, right? <laughs> right. Uh, two coconut trees, and that was the tree farm. It was a tax deduction for I, Baby Rubo. <laughs> I know Baby knew what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
but literally there were, you know, most of the houses were small. There were the old mackles. Uh, a lot of them had no fences around them, so if you played tag in the middle, you'd run in people's backyards and go around. Um, so they were all neighborhood parks, but we started losing all those neighborhood parks. They all got developed, they all got built over. Um, so it's interesting that we're going full circle, and here we are starting with the idea of a neighborhood park again, you know, where people can just run and do whatever they want to do. Because uh, that's kind of how it used to be. You know, we grew, we grew too fast, the demographics changed, it's, you know, a lot of things have changed. But this kind of takes you back to the idea that, you know, anywhere can be a, a neighborhood park. You know, what it was like to be 13, 14, 15 years old in the, in the mid-70s out here. Um, and there's a lot of funny anecdotes. There are, I'm sure. <laughs> you, know, you guys want to chime into one, you know, those. There was, there was a guy on, down the street here. I lived my first house on, on Key Biscayne. We rented at West Heather, 361 West Heather Drive. And there was a guy about four houses over who had a cougar as a pet. A big oh old cougar. Oh my gosh, wow. And he'd walk him around like, like a... Oh. Okay. So there were a lot of interesting people back then as well. Anyway, so I, I thought I'd share those kind of thoughts with you. Yeah, my son would, in the golf course, golf course would dive in supposedly to get balls, but he found a sewer pipe and he swam through the sewer pipe. Oh. I only found out about that a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I think a lot of things went on that the parents didn't know. Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So you leave your house in the morning, you didn't come back. and Yeah, right. Very free. Very free. Little traffic, little, you know. I much. like what you said about the fact that there were no fences. Remember that? I mean, my, I don't, well, this is before your time, but we had a dog, Duke, that everybody knew on Kibis Kane. He used to spend time at the Yacht Club on weekends, but he would follow me to school sometimes. And then over the loudspeaker, Diane Freed, your dog Duke is here. <laughs> and I'd have to I'd have to get on my bike, but I could I could lose him by going through yards. I mean that was how I would lose him, because there were no fences and no hedges. Right. Yeah. And then I could get back to class and he'd find his way home. <laughs> You never worried about your kids riding their bikes to schools because there were so many bikes. neighbors that knew your kids. They knew they couldn't get away with anything. So yeah. It was nice. Yeah, I had two dogs. Well, and I had this one shepherd, and we lived right across the street from the school bus stop. So all of a sudden, I hear all this commotion out in front of my house. I go running out, and my dog is sitting in the driver's seat with its <laughs> paws on the steering wheel. It had scared the driver to death. The driver <laughs> Thank you guys for uh, working so hard on this park. Yes. Uh, it's, it means a lot. No, you've done an amazing job. You've really brought it to life. It's far from being just a passive park. It's a passive active park, which is great. Brett's very quiet back there, but as the park's designer... Mm. Thank you for... I mean, I'm glad you guys are enjoying using it. It's always gratifying to hear that. I mean, I, I didn't get here till 1979, but there's somebody else who... Well, I should, Prudence, or Twinkie, and I were in kindergarten at the Little Island Playhouse back in 1959, which was on the old plantation. Mm -hmm. So we go back a long way. We go back a long way. <laughs> and Diane, when did your parents move to Key Biscayne? 1951. My, my older we brother, all moved Scott. Together. Yep. So you had that great big tree. With the tree and house. The ficus tree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Huge ficus tree. Like the little family, the Robin, what was that? The, the Robinson? Swiss family Robinson. Big, yeah, yeah, Swiss family Robinson. That's what I used to think about right. when I'd we see that. I thought thing. it was the coolest <laughs> yeah. tree house ever. I thank you to everyone that, that came and, and took part in this. Um, I think this is something that uh, is really special and unique um, and needs to be preserved, which is, you know, hearing about our history. Um, you know, we have a lot of new residents out here who don't necessarily have that same sense of community and of uh, closeness with neighbors um, and, and the opportunity to bring people together in a place like this um, is really why we're so glad that we were able to create this park. You know, hopefully people will continue to come out here and use the park, but also will continue to be involved in the community and voice what they want and help achieve those goals. Um, and if the goal is more neighborhood parks, which hopefully it is, 
um, if the goal is more green space, you know, um, hopefully we can do that all together. I just um, feel very strongly that the, these new parks are going to have to be part of the village's responsibility and they are going to have to learn how to take care of these parks and how to carefully prune different types and species of trees and plants and not to think that they can do it all in a day with, uh, certainly not with uh, machetes, but actually with, with skillful tools that people learn to use in small areas and in private parks as well as the public parks that are now, in this day and age, being reinvented and necessary for the overpopulated communities. So thanks. How inspiring. I wish that I had been here in those early days to be a kid climbing. I was climbing trees and jumping in ponds and running across golf courses in Virginia when you were doing that. But uh, yeah, I moved here just as incorporation was happening and um, saw the kerfuffle going on in the causeway as I was dashing to work and coming back and said, who are these amazing people? Uh, my involvement was when I um, got pregnant uh, and it was after Hurricane Andrew and it was a devastated island and uh, I was about to have this baby and I said, oh my God, you know, there, where are the playgrounds? Where are the parks? Where, you know, we all, how are we gonna raise our children? Uh, we, need, we need a real um, community. And then I, I started learning from Betty and, and others. Um, and Betty sat me down in her kitchen uh, at one point when I was advocating for playground. Um, with some other parents, mostly moms. And she said, you know, you've got to step up. It's your turn. You've got to get your friends organized. So we, we listened. And after the playgrounds advocated for the community center and uh, got a real education about uh, local government and involving the community through that 10 year experience. Um, and on to parks and it's, endless and I hope that we as a community can continue to, we can try to recreate through neighborhood parks and through other parks this connection to each other and to nature. That is just what I've heard in, in everything all of you have said. Uh, it's that access to, to nature, to, to really experience it on a daily basis, to have our children and grandchildren and ourselves live in the embrace of the natural environment that's so precious here. And if we don't fight for it, if we don't advocate for it, we just will not have it. So thank you and thank you, Steve. Thank you for, for being such a driving force in the Land Acquisition Committee. It, it, we would not have this park if it weren't for you and your family. I really appreciate our speakers that have come and those of you who have come to listen, thank you. And uh, I, you know, I hope that this um, is a valuable event for, for everyone that participates.